On this Friday night, an emotional plea for help. We really do believe that they're out there. They're all survivors. A Canadian woman's desperation to restart the search for her boyfriend, among dozens missing at sea. Global News has learned the upcoming throne speech will focus on a long-term pandemic plan. Plus, the severed head of Canada's first prime minister. How did this get the stamp of approval? And the cheap shot as NFL players try to sideline racism in a new era for the league. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Robin Gill. Good evening and thank you for joining us. We begin tonight with a desperate plea for help from a Canadian woman who believes her boyfriend and others are still alive, despite being lost at sea over a week ago. The Gulf Livestock One, carrying about 6,000 cattle, sank off the East China Sea on September 2nd. Three of the crew were rescued, one of whom later died. Charlie Gray was due to meet her boyfriend, William Main Prize, in the coming weeks after being separated during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm really looking forward to finally being together and yeah and, and journeying together from that point on so um yeah it's been really frustrating having you know covid and then obviously this is just devastating to say the least this week japan's coast guard scaled back its search but as redmond shannon reports friends and family of the crew say the rescue efforts must continue this is the Gulf Livestock One heading into Typhoon Maysac last week. Pretty wild weather. Among the 43 crew members on board, adventurous Australian William Mainprize, sending regular voice messages to his Toronto girlfriend, Charlie Gray. I realise today it's about a month until I'll be seeing you. Which I'm psyched about. But Mainprize clearly realised this storm wasn't routine. A little bit crazy busy it's like super gnarly weather on this thing the gulf livestock one had been taking thousands of cattle from new zealand to a port in northern china on september 2nd near southern japan it took on water and capsized the japanese coast guard initially found this man in the water i'm only one yes yes, no yes, other, yes. No other one. They would find two more men, one of whom later died. Forty crew, including main prize, are still missing. Aussie stockmen like him are renowned for being tough. We really do believe that they're out there. They're all survivors. And the technology on the life rafts and boats that are missing are also meant to survive these sort of things. But following another typhoon, the Japanese Coast Guard scaled back its search this week, devastating loved ones of the Filipino, New Zealand and Australian crew. So the fact that it, it stopped or at least slowed to a more normal pace just felt like it was way too soon, you know. And he really is one of those people that's just, he's just every good way that you could describe a person. And um, he's just, yeah, generous and compassionate, funny, um, so caring, so good with people. The Australian government is assuring families Japanese air and sea patrols continue to search for survivors. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. To the pandemic now and the surge in cases of COVID-19 in Canada. With numbers on the rise, Ontario Premier Doug Ford is urging residents to avoid large gatherings. That province recorded its highest daily total of new cases since June. All I've been asking is please try to avoid these big gatherings. Uh, please try to avoid, uh, you know, the, the weddings that I heard were 150, 170 people. Uh, just follow the guidelines and everyone everyone will, will be okay. Today, Ontario reported 213 new infections, passing the 200 mark for the first time in three months. Quebec recorded 219 new cases. In the West, BC recorded 132 new cases, while Alberta has 111 new cases of COVID-19. Canada's first voluntary quarantine facility opens tomorrow in Toronto with funding from the federal government. It'll cost $13.9 million to operate the 140-room centre over the next year. It's aimed at those who can't self-isolate at home. Users of the hotel-based facility will stay in their rooms for 14 days and get meals and regular check-ins. 
Toronto Public Health will determine who is eligible, but the location isn't being made public because of privacy concerns. Ottawa plans to fund similar sites in other municipalities. Global News has learned how the government plans to deal with the pandemic long term. That's going to be the centerpiece in the upcoming throne speech. Our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson has been digging into what's in that speech and what isn't. Mercedes. Robin, the speech from the throne is what sets the government's agenda and it will primarily focus on managing what's happening right now with the ongoing pandemic. The government very much still sees this as being in crisis mode, according to senior government sources. And there is a belief that COVID-19 could last in this current state for up to another two years. The speech from the throne won't include actual numbers or detailed plans, but rather it will chart a course that the sources say will focus on stopping another back slide into the kind of numbers we saw of COVID-19 early in the spring. It will also set out new flexible supports for Canadians that will focus on health and finances. Expect to see child care, health care and housing as big ticket items that the government will be leaning towards, according to one senior source. Cabinet is also weighing a significant injection of spending for the provinces to go towards things like long-term care homes, as well as programs that will be targeted for those who were the hardest hit in the pandemic, low-income women and racialized Canadians. Also expect to see EI become more flexible. Lower on the agenda, that proposed green shift a lot of people were talking about. Multiple sources had told Global News that there were factions in cabinet that wanted as much as $100 billion in green spending. But that's being put on the back burner as the government deals with the immediate threat of the novel coronavirus. Mercedes, are we expecting anything in the throne speech about balancing the budget and getting out of all this spending? Well, Robin, the recovery is in mind, as you've heard the Prime Minister promising to build back better, but not details on how this will all be paid down. Right now, government sources say that they plan to grow their way out of debt by getting more people into the workforce. They're also willing to abandon those traditional fiscal measurements like debt to GDP ratio in the short term. The speech from the throne will look at what one source called a green recovery, making Canada more resilient to future economic shocks like pandemics and doing things like bringing critical supply chains back here to Canada. But we won't know details on the numbers or how they'll get out of this for some time. The speech from the throne will be light on those details. We'll hear something this fall in terms of a fiscal update, but don't expect a budget until around March. Robin? Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa. The Prime Minister is weighing in on the We Charity controversy for the first time since the organization revealed it's shuttering its Canadian operations. Justin Trudeau has been criticized for being too close to We, but today he was very careful to keep his distance. Abigail Beeman is following the story for us. Abigail, what did the Prime Minister have to say today? Robin, the Prime Minister was asked whether he took any responsibility for Wee's closure. His answer was long, one minute and 42 seconds, but in that time he never mentioned the organization's name. Here's some of what he said. We moved uh, rapidly with a partner that we felt was able to actually deliver it. Obviously the way it ended up working out um, was really unfortunate for everyone involved. Especially for students, said the Prime Minister, since the program that could have been worth close to a billion dollars never got off the ground. The deal fell apart amid a political firestorm after it emerged members of Justin Trudeau's family were paid hundreds of thousands of dollars in speaking fees for WE events. While committees trying to investigate what happened are on hold with Parliament prorogued, the opposition is still pushing the issue. The NDP sent a new letter to the lobbying commissioner asking questions, including including whether the Kielberger brothers themselves should have registered as lobbyists, even though 18 other members of the organization did during the controversy. Mark and Craig Kielberger did not. The lobbying commissioner has opened a preliminary assessment in this case, but does not comment whether investigations are underway. The prime minister didn't offer any specific comment Friday about news we is shutting down operations in Canada. As I said, I regret not having recused myself in the beginning because of the perception uh, involved. But there was no conflict of interest here. So a doubling down on previous messaging. Ultimately, the ethics commissioner will rule as to the question of conflict with an investigation still underway. Although Trudeau disagreed with the commissioner's findings, the last time Mario Dion found the prime minister broke the rules over the SNC-Lavalin affair. 
Robin. All right, thanks, Abigail. There's a new development tonight in the Rod Graywall scandal. The former Liberal MP has been charged with breach of trust and fraud. The RCMP alleged Graywall broke the law by failing to report millions of dollars in personal loans and that he used his political position to get those loans. Graywall has admitted he had a gambling addiction and racked up millions of dollars in debt. He claims the money came from friends and family and that he paid it all back. In 2018, Graywall left the Liberal caucus. He did not run for re-election in 2019. Oregon, Washington and California are struggling to contain dozens of wildfires. At least 24 people have been killed, several others are still missing. The unprecedented fires are being fueled by hot, dry temperatures. And as Jennifer Johnson explains, the weather isn't letting up anytime soon. From Washington state to the U.S.-Mexico border, the western part of America is ablaze. Hundreds of out-of-control wildfires are scorching California, Oregon and Washington. Over 500,000 people in Oregon have been ordered to evacuate their homes. 10% of the population, an unprecedented number. We have never seen this amount of uncontained fire across our state. Drone footage shows the eerie devastation in some Oregon communities. Residents had little time to get out when the Almeda fire came raging in. Everything was gone. I only managed to grab my family and my dog and it's awful. In California, six of the state's largest wildfires have occurred this fire season. Daring helicopter rescues have saved many, but other residents have had to take desperate actions. Eight of us had to go down to the end of our road, go into the sand and get down in the water to avoid the fire. Twice this week, some California firefighters had to deploy emergency shelters like these after being surrounded by flames. We're in the midst of a climate crisis. Uh, we are experiencing weather conditions the likes of which we've never experienced in our lifetime. Climate change activists say global warming, hotter than ever temperatures, high winds and little rain are fueling these fires and many warn it'll only get worse. People tweet the photographs of what San Francisco looked like yesterday and say, oh, 2020, could you get any worse? As if once we're in 2021, these kinds of disasters are going to stop happening. San Francisco, which had been a glow in orange, is seeing slightly better air quality as winds die down a bit. It's been really difficult. But further up north, winds are increasing, accelerating flames and more destruction. Jennifer Johnson, Global News. Ceremonies are being held across the U.S. today to mark the 19th anniversary of the deadliest terror attack in America's history. <laughs> Bells rang out in Pennsylvania as the names of the passengers and crew of Flight 93 were read aloud. The United Airlines plane crashed into a field after being hijacked by terrorists on September 11, 2001. Everyone on board was killed. Lee Adler. A scaled-down ceremony was held at the Memorial Plaza in New York. It paid tribute to the nearly 3,000 people who lost their lives when two planes crashed into the towers of the World Trade Center. Tonight, double beams of light will be turned on to evoke those twin towers. It has taken nearly 13 years, but justice has finally been served in the deadliest gang shooting in B.C. history. Former Red Scorpions leader Jamie Bacon has been sentenced to 18 years in prison for his part in what became known as the Surrey Six Killings. In 2007, six people were killed in an apartment building just east of Vancouver. Two of the victims were innocent bystanders. With credit for time served, Bacon has five years and seven months left behind bars. Stamp of disapproval coming up. Why did Canada Post print these stamps featuring the severed head of Canada's first prime minister? Canada Post is apologizing for printing a stamp that features the severed head of a John A. Macdonald statue that was pulled down by protesters in Montreal. The stamp was printed through a program intended to help people celebrate birthdays or anniversaries. But a federal employee used the program as a means of protest and solidarity with those who pulled down the statue. Our chief political correspondent, David Aiken, also happens to collect stamps. And it's not the first time Canada Post has been pranked. David? Well, that's right, Robin. You know, most of us use stamps actually designed by Canada Post, like this legitimate Sir John A. Macdonald stamp. This is from 2015, marked the bicentennial of his birth. 1.5 million copies were printed up. But if you had a favorite photo and you wanted to put that on a sheet of 50 stamps, 
You could, it would only cost you about 120 bucks. But people have used that vanity program for political and social protest. Back in 2006, Frank Magazine did that, printed up a few stamps, one with a Disney character, another with someone wearing a Nazi uniform. And back in the late 70s, opponents of Pierre Elliott Trudeau distributed what are called overprint stamps. You can see the words Fuddle Duddle and R-I-P-P-E-T that were overprinted on actual Canada Post stamps. Now, none of these are very valuable to collectors. You might find copies on eBay for a few bucks these days, but Canada Post takes this very seriously, and they are now reviewing their processes to make sure that no stamp with an inappropriate image ends up in your mailbox. Robin? David Aiken in Ottawa. Thanks, David. Still ahead, the audition for answers to solve live theater's pandemic problems. Well, they are topics we don't normally hear the Pope weighing in on. In a new book of interviews, the pontiff refers to food and sex as gifts from God that are simply divine. Pope Francis says the pleasure of eating is there to keep you healthy and sexual pleasure is there to make love more beautiful and guarantee the perpetuation of the species. He adds overzealous views on so-called carnal sins that deny pleasure have caused enormous harm. COVID-19 has forced many companies to change the way they do business, but there are some industries that are in a prolonged intermission. Live theatre needs a packed house to be profitable, but as Mike Drolet explains, the seats are empty. This is the heart of Canada's vibrant theatre scene. For six months, its old heartbeat has been missing. Live theater, like sporting events and concerts, is all about the audience. If officials have begun planning for a reopening, theater insiders aren't privy to them. The only people that can answer that question are the public health officials. That unknown is causing unease. In the UK, theater legend Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber says the industry is on the precipice. It's, it is, it's in my view, um, I, I, I think we are now at the point of no return, really. Lloyd Webber has asked for a target date to reopen, but that hope is partly built on the dream they'll be able to fill every seat and not the 30% capacity Ray Fine's one-man show in London is limited to. I mean, these, these large shows can cost up to a million dollars a week to put on, so you can't bring in that kind of income at only 30% of capacity. As it is, most shows are budgeted to break even at 80% capacity. So what can be done? Can theater embrace the digital world? And does that even work with live performances? Everything right now is on hold, including the burgeoning career of actor Hannah Smart, who wrapped up touring as a cast member of We Will Rock You in February. So I, for six months, lived out of a tour bus and toured everywhere from New York to LA, Texas, we did Toronto, Calgary, like it was, it was a dream come true, it was crazy. The Calgary native had high hopes for the rest of the year. Now she's looking for a retail job until she can start auditioning again. In January, February is kind of the, the main audition season in Toronto especially, and so it's gonna be interesting to see what it looks like come 2021 to see if they can even do auditions in person. So many what ifs need to be resolved before the curtain can rise again. Mike Drillet, Global News, Toronto. Up next, the pandemic play. The NFL struggles to tackle social injustice. Watching Global National. The NFL kicked off its season last night, but the backdrop to the game was much more than football. For years, the league has wrestled with racial injustice and the freedom its players have to express themselves. Now, confronting both America's racial divide and COVID-19, the NFL is back in the spotlight. Eric Sorensen reports. They stood together, opponents demonstrating common cause against racial injustice, led by the new face of the NFL, Super Bowl MVP Patrick Mahomes. We wanted to show that we, we're unified as a league, and we're not going to let playing football distract us from what we're doing and making change in this world. But the return of North America's richest sports enterprise showed the NFL still appears to be the most conflicted league in pro sports. When the national anthem played, the Kansas City Chiefs stood, but one player took a knee. 
The Houston Texans only came out after the anthem. And when both teams gathered for that moment of silence in midfield, there were some boos from the crowd. The players say their message of equality was for a bigger audience. We wanted to use this big platform where we know millions of people are going to be watching. As for the crowd, Kansas City is among the few teams allowing fans to attend, about a quarter of capacity. Spacing for tailgate parties, distancing in the stands, and the masks, all signs one more sport is taking on COVID-19. It's a unique year, and um, we're all aware of it. We trust the protocol. But taking on racial injustice remains a particular challenge in pro football. Most players are black, yet league executives and owners are overwhelmingly white. Get that son of a off the field right now. Prodded by President Donald Trump, the NFL for a long time shunned the movement started by quarterback Colin Kaepernick, who first took a knee to call attention to police brutality toward black people. If I was George Floyd, if I was George Floyd. But in the wake of the death of George Floyd, pro athletes led by the NBA took a stand, postponing games to protest racial inequality. And as NFL players unified to take up the cause, that anything is possible. The league, with videos like this, seemed to recognize the need to get in step with its players and changing society. Sports has been a big part of social change through the years. Mm -hmm. well, I think the league acknowledged that it failed. They had to come out and essentially issue a mea culpa and try to be better this time around. For many Americans, it's exciting just to have football again to distract from the pandemic. But finding a unified voice on racial equality is a game still in progress. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Friday. I'm Robin Gill. The Toronto Raptors have put racial injustice front and center. And tonight, ahead of their must-win Game 7 against Boston, the city's mayor is cheering the team on. We are so proud of who you are and what you are and how you play. Bring on Game 7. We're with you all the way. Go Raptors! That's the same suit he wore when the Raptors won last year. Now with a matching mask, let's hope history repeats. Thank you for watching. Have a great night, and I'll see you back here this weekend.